Welcome to a look ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a new series that we're just starting. Uh, this is lesson number two in that series entitled Present Truth in Deuteronomy. And lesson number two for October 9 is entitled Moses' History Lesson. So we suggested in our last lesson that one of the first sections of this book does talk about history and what we might, what they were supposed to learn from history. So let's see what we can learn from their history. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Wonderful Father, we thank you so much for the ways in which you have led in the past. We ask that you will continue to lead us now. If, if ever there was a time when we needed your guidance and your care and your direction, it is as we approach the end of this world's history. Guide us as we study together that we may learn what you want us to learn from this book is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Deuteronomy begins with these words. These are the words which Moses spoke. And that's translated a little differently in some other versions, but basically it's the same idea as Deuteronomy 1 verse 1. This book recounts the history of the children of Israel from the time they were at the foot of Mount Sinai until that time that they were ready to enter the land of Canaan. But the book is really a history of the partnership between Moses and God and, of course, its consequences. The real issue is about Jesus Christ, and we'll talk about why we say that a little bit later, who led the children of Israel through all those difficulties. Moses realized how important it was for the children of Israel to recognize all that the Lord had done for them in the past. This is a theme which is a precursor to all of Scripture. This is a theme which is still true of us. Jim? In reviewing our past history, having traveled over every step of advance to our present understanding, I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and is teaching in our past history. Ellen White, Life Schedules, page 196. That was done, at least published in 1915. Yeah, so that's the year she right, died. right at the end there. Yeah. Haven't we heard some famous world leaders say something like that yes. since then several times? Yes, we have. I want you to notice, however, it says, uh, except as we shall forget, forget the way the Lord has led us. It's not talking about the times when we depart from his leadership. Right. It's talking about when the times we followed his leadership. So right. that's an important caveat in reading that and understanding that passage. It is important for us to recognize that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible only shortly after the very first alphabet was invented. People think it was invented somewhere out in the, in the Sinai Peninsula. Maybe it was invented in an attempt to try to communicate what was happening in the mines and so forth out there, back to headquarters somewhere in, in Egypt, uh, near the Nile River, we, we don't know, but uh, it- That's yeah. the words that they found on in some of those- They found some things out there, yes. Passages. Prior to that time, written materials were in hieroglyphics in Egypt, or in cuneiform in the Mesopotamian Valley. Writing with an alphabet was a much more precise and detailed way of recording history than the previous methods. Pictographic reading, which we call hieroglyphics, or even cuneiform writing, you sort of read along and sort of make it up as you go, <laughs> because it's, oh yeah, there's a picture and there's a picture, oh yeah, I think that's what that means. And, but the Hebrew words, they have some symbols that are, yeah. some pic, are somewhat pictorial. But they're still, they're been, still letters of the alphabet. Yeah, they've yeah. been tweaked. Yeah. But they had a sound to go with it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. Writing with an alphabet was a much more precise and detailed way of recording history than the previous methods. Nevertheless, the vocabulary and alphabet that Moses was able to use were quite limited. I want you to think about this. Do you think he had Webster's Dictionary handy? I mean, you know, he's, he's been separated from Egypt for 40 years. He learned that back there, and he probably, well, we're going to read something about what he did while he was still out there in Midian, 
but he hasn't been speaking e e Egyptian. He, e you know, what, uh, undoubtedly Moses learned how to write using an alphabet while serving as a prince in Egypt. While in the land of Midian, we read this about him. Carrie? The long years spent amid desert solitudes were not lost. Not only was Moses gaining a preparation for the great work before him, but during this time, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wrote the book of Genesis and also the book of Job, which would be read with the deepest interest by the people of God until the close of time. And that's from Ellen White, Signs of the Times, February 19, 1880. Okay. Now I want you to think about that. Genesis is a fairly lengthy book, 50 chapters as we divide it up now. So did Moses carry that under his arm when he went back to Egypt? The book of Job is 42 yeah. chapters. Or did, those, did his father-in-law keep those books and, and went, bring them to him when he, he came later? Had plenty of time to do that in the 40 years. Yeah. 40 years in the wilderness. I'm is. always encouraged as I think about my own age that Moses began his major work at the age of? 80. 80. <laughs> what you, <laughs> yeah, you didn't have to laugh. <laughs> what should we learn about Moses and about God from the story recorded in Exodus 32, 29 to 32? Myra? Moses said to the Levites, Today you have consecrated yourselves as priests to the service of the Lord by killing your sons and brothers. So the Lord has given you his blessing. Okay, let's interrupt there for a second. What led up to this? Okay, when Moses came down from the mountain and he saw them dancing drunk and naked around that golden calf and he dropped the, the, the Ten Commandments and so forth, all that stuff, this is what's the preamble to this. The only tribe that did not get involved with the dancing and the drunkenness and all that kind of stuff around the golden calf were the tribe of Levi, except for who else from the, who from the tribe of Levi was involved? Who was it? Well, Aaron. Aaron. Aaron, of course, and he ended up being the high priest. But the tribe of Levi didn't. So Moses says, okay, you people, who, he said, separate me, the people who didn't do this and the people who did. And here's the tribe of Levi. So it's okay, you Levites, you go through and it is your job to kill all the people who are leaders in this affair with the golden calf. And they did. And so Except now, Aaron. Huh? Except Aaron. Except Aaron once again. How did he... Anyway. So, because they were faithful, didn't get involved with this process, and because they went around and killed the people they were told to kill, what happened next? The next day, Moses said to the people, You have committed a terrible sin, but now I will go again. I will again go up the mountain to the Lord. Perhaps I can obtain forgiveness for your sin. Moses then returned to the Lord and said, These people have committed a terrible sin. They have made a god out of gold and worshipped it. Please forgive their sin, but if you won't, then remove my name from the book in which you have written the names of your people. Okay. I hope this raises a lot of questions in your mind. What does Moses know about any book? Where would he have learned that? That's just the first question. Uh, well, he did, he did spend 40 years communing with God between the age of 40 and 80. Yeah. And the sheep. Do you think God personally told him about that book? Yep. Well, we believe that God guided him in writing two books while he was still out there, don't we? Mm -hmm. We believe that God guided him in writing the book of Genesis and the book of Job. So maybe so. So what's he asking, what do you think he's, he's expecting to happen when he made, he made that statement? If you can't forgive them, then take my name off of the books. What's going on there? Well, he's, apparently, 
believing that this is not the God that he wants to, to worship if he can't forgive these people. Yeah, these, these people, I know them. They're, they're decent people by and large. They got carried away. Mm -hmm. Come on, God. But how do you, did he, I mean, did he really think that by asking to have his name taken out of that book, it would somehow help them? Well, he was sure close with the people and it, uh... Well, what does this teach us about the character of Moses? And I'm going to suggest that God did this just to demonstrate how considerate and how loving Moses was because God already knows what he's going to do. What's he going to do 40 years later? Take him, him to heaven. He's going to take him to heaven. And he wants the people in heaven to understand what kind of person Moses is, was or is. Why would God make such a statement, a request to God? Did Moses really think that by offering to have his name removed from books from the books of heaven, he could somehow atone for the sins of the people? Or is it even possible that Moses thought that if all the children of Israel are lost and not able to go to heaven, he did not want to go to heaven alone without them? Is that possible? Well, that's a question. I, I, I don't know that we have the answer to that question. I will have to ask him someday. There's a hint that Moses was suggesting to God that he should bear the sins of the people. Now, I think this is a little bit of a stretch, but let's talk about it. Is this an early expression of substitution? We often talk about how Jesus bore in himself the full brunt and penalty of our sins. What do we mean by that? Jesus bore the, in himself the full brunt and penalty of our sins. He died the second death, the death that sinners will die at the end. It says that specifically in the book Desire of Ages. Is that what Moses was trying to do here? What actually happens when Jesus bears our sins? Do we understand the seriousness of sin? Well, look at Deuteronomy 1, 1 to 6. See if it gives us some help. From the Good News Bible. In this book are the words that Moses spoke to the people of Israel when they were in the wilderness east of the River Jordan. They were in the Jordan Valley near Sup, Sup, S-U-P-H, between the town of Paran on one side and the town of Tophels, Laban, Hazareth, and Dizahab on the other. Uh, my condolences to those who were saying those wrong. <laughs> in, in the, it takes 11 days to travel from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea by way of the country of Edom. Okay, let's interrupt this for a little. 11 days. They should have been in the land of Canaan probably took them a little while, would have taken them a little while to get ready to battle, but if they had followed God's directions, they would have been in the, in the land of Canaan in a couple weeks. Well, a, after a year at Sinai, let's, let's not forget that. They spent a year down there. From there to the land of Canaan, two weeks, just say, generously. And what happened? Forty years later, they're still trying to get in. Verse 3. On the first day of the 11th month of the 40th year after they had left Egypt, Moses told the people everything the Lord had commanded him to tell them. This was after the Lord had defeated King Sihon of the Amorites, who ruled in the town of Heshbon, and King Og of Bashan, who ruled the towns of Ashtaroth and Edri. Okay, let me talk about that for a second. Now, you know, as a child, when I thought about this and we just okay the children of Israel left Egypt and they went up there and they wandered around the wilderness a little well I just assumed that they would just go in well that would be Egypt is what direction from from Canaan southwest so a couple of weeks they would be right there and, and they they were 
But they finally ended up doing what? Going all the way around Edom, around Moab, around Ammon, and what they, they crossed over, they conquered these two nations. Actually, I should be doing it this way for your benefit. They conquered these two smaller nations in the northern part of what we would now call the, the, the country of Jordan, and then they came down in, in, along the, in front of the, the country of Moab, camped across the river from Jericho. So instead of attacking from the southwest, they were, I mean, instead of attacking from the southwest, from, from your point of view, they ended up entering the, or, or approaching the land of Canaan from the northeast. They went all the way around. Okay. And took 40 years to do it. And took 40 years to do it. It was while the people were east of Jordan in the territory of Moab that Moses began to explain God's laws and teachings. Hadn't he done that before? Well, you would have thought so. He said, verse 6, when we, were, when we were at Mount Sinai, the Lord our God said to us, you have stayed long enough at this mountain. Of course, that's the ghost from, again from the Good News Bible. After that disastrous story of what happened at Kadesh Barnea, Moses was told that they would wander in the wilderness for 40 years, one year for each day that the spies were in the land. And that's, of course, New Numbers 14, 34. That is exactly what happened. Forty years later, Moses reported that they were ready to cross the Jordan. What does this tell us about God's ability to predict the future? The prophecies of Daniel 9, 24 to 27, 8, verse 14, and Revelation 12 are amazing bits of biblical history. And I might add, because we Adventists are so concerned about the details of historical, the fulfillment of historical uh, prophecies, our scholars have worked that out. No other church that I know of has got this even close. You look at major commentaries, they have not, they're completely off on these dates. But if you carefully go back and you look at the records and you work out the dates, it's amazing. Every detail, crazy things happen, but every detail all the way down to the life of Christ and the events that happened later along with the prophecies of the, of, of, uh, the times of Paul and so forth, every, every single one of those things fits exactly down to the exact year. It's, it's amazing. To so those who carefully study the historical details of these prophecies of Daniel Revelation, it is clear that God was able to predict not only what humans would do in the future, but also how he would respond and what the results would be. Does it give us more courage and trust in God when we know that he is fully aware of the future far in advance? It's a little scary sometimes to think about that. While still at, the, still at the foot of Mount Sinai, following the suggestions of his father-in-law, Moses organized the people into groups of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. This made things a lot smoother, a lot better organized, and allowed Moses time to do other things which he needed to do. And Nehemiah, a thousand years later, commented about that in Nehemiah 9.21, through 40 years in the desert, you provided all that they needed. Their clothing never wore out, and their feet were not swollen with pain. And Myra, I'm going to pick on you right now. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what else God promised them out there in the desert? No woman would have an abortion. Miscarriage. Miscarriage, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, have, I didn't they, imply a medical kind of abortion. Did they have lots of children then? Oh, yeah. I'm sure they weren't wasting their time having children. Moses, under the guidance of God, recognized the necessity for organization. Jim? Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. But how can I alone bear the heavy responsibility for setting, settling your disputes? Choose some wise, understanding, and experienced men from each tribe, and I will put them in charge of you. And, and you agreed that this was a good thing to do. So I took the wise and experienced leaders you chose from your tribes, and I placed them in your charge. It's going to be in charge of you. Some were responsible for thousands, some for hundreds, for hundred, 
some for 50, some for 10. I also appointed other officials throughout the tribes. Okay, so <clears throat> what's happening here? I mean, he's got, he's got a couple of million people to deal with. I mean, it, and Jethro showed up, and what did he find Moses doing? He was handling it all himself. He was trying to settle all the disputes between different people all himself, from early morning to late at night, Ellen White says. I mean, you can Im just imagine, everybody comes, well, but he said, he said, he said, she did this, he did da, da, da. Imagine, I mean, can you just imagine putting up with that all day long? And Jethro said, I have a suggestion. Why don't you pick some wise people? And it was, it was a huge benefit. And we don't have time to talk about it right now, but who complained when that happened? At that time, I instructed them, listen to the disputes that come up among your people. Judge every dispute fairly, whether it concerns only your own people or involves foreigners who live among you. I show no partial, excuse me, show no partiality in your decisions. Judge everyone on the same basis, no matter who they do, are. Do not be afraid of anyone, for the decisions you make come from God. If any case is too difficult for you, bring it to me and I will decide it. Good News Bible. Okay, <laughs> once again, under the guidance of God. Even when wandering through the desert as a large group, they needed to be organized. Does this tell us anything about our need for organization today? Think of Paul's comments in 1 Corinthians 12. What, what happens in 1 Corinthians 12? That's the whole story about a body needs an eye, and it needs ears, and it needs hands, and it needs feet, and no part of the body can tell the other parts, I don't really need you, you know? Sometimes today, people complain about church organization. Have you ever heard anything like that? Never. <laughs> they, dis they disdain organized religion. Would they rather have disorganized religion? God always wants everything to be done decently and in order, and of course that's quoting scripture. God's original plan for Israel was for the children of Israel to successfully travel to Canaan after that time at the foot of Mount Sinai without any further delays. And it should have taken them how long? Couple weeks. Yep. Two weeks. Eleven days. But then, of course, it would. I mean, I allow a few extra days because I'm sure they would have got themselves organized and wait for God to guide them. So it would have taken a little bit. But I mean, easily within two weeks, right? But then they had the unfortunate experience with the spies in the rebellion at Kadesh Barnea. The Book of Deuteronomy really is a review of everything that happened after that. So, question. <laughs> Why did they send those spies into the land? When writing the book of Numbers at the beginning of the 40 years, Moses seemed to think that everything that happened was under the direct guidance of God. And we've already talked about that in our last lesson. There's no talk about the devil. There's no talk about his being involved with anything. It was sort of anything that you can't explain from a human perspective. God did it. So what does it say in Numbers 13, 1 and 2? The Lord said to Moses, Choose one of the leaders from each of the twelve tribes and send them as spies to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. That's from the Good News Bible. Okay, I'm wondering what would you have thought if you know there was a mass of people gathering at your border and here come these twelve guys that are strangers, obviously, don't speak your language, and you're sort of wandering around looking at things, hmm, Hmm, hmm. <laughs> would, you, would you say, uh, by the way, what is your name? What are you doing here? <laughs> I just wonder. You know, you, I can, I can, maybe they went, I, I just don't know. I think about spies, we, we usually think of one person who's trying to look like the local people and he sort of tries to blend in and so forth. But 12 people march, do you think they all went together or did they go different directions? I don't know. When the 12 spies came back, they were carrying, oh, oh, by the way, that whole story is recorded in Numbers 13 and 14. When the 12 spies came back, they were carrying wonderful evidence of the fertility of the land. Unfortunately, 10 of the spies brought back a false report because they were afraid. And what did they say? There were giants over there, right? Only Caleb and Joshua said, We have no need to fear if we follow the Lord's guidance. 
the Lord will fight for us. Now, whose idea was it that they should send spies into the land? Well, do you believe numbers or something else? Well, let's, what does it say? This is, these are both written by Moses. Yeah, Deuteronomy 1, verses 22 and 23. But you came to me and said, let's send men ahead of us to spy, in the, out, spy out the land so, they can, so that they can tell us the best route to take and what kind of cities there are. It seemed to be a good thing to do. So I selected 12 men from each tribe. One from each tribe. One, yes. Okay, well, so. Not necessarily a genius thing to do then, was it? But uh, something by committee. So, yeah, right. Okay, so how, how, are they, how did they decide to do this? Back in new Numbers, when Moses was riding along, he sort of, everything that seemed to happen, well, this is God's guidance. This is God's guidance. That was the way he put it down. That, it, it seemed like that to him at the time. But looking back, he remembers what? The people came to me and said, let's do this. Let's do this. And Moses said, well, that looks like a good idea. Did he consult the Lord? No record of it. No record of that. Let's not just do this. Let's do this in spite of what God told us to do. Yes. In fact, as we're going to see in a little while. As a result of that terrible experience at Kadesh Barnea, the children of Israel turned back into the wilderness and wandered for 40 years. And you remember what happened without taking a long time. The spies went in, they looked, they came back, and 10 gave that terrible report, and the two gave the good report, and then the people rebelled, and anyway, just, just we'll talk about that a little bit more now. Something else quite remarkable happened at the beginning of those 40 years. Numbers 14, 11 to 20. From the Good News Bible, the Lord said to Moses, how much longer will these people reject me? How much longer will they refuse to trust in me, even though I have performed so many miracles among them? I will send an epidemic and destroy them. Have we ever heard of an epidemic lately or a pandemic? Do we know anything about that? But I will make you the father of a nation that is larger and more powerful than they are. But Moses said to the Lord, you brought these people out of Egypt by your power. When the Egyptians hear what you have done to your people, they will tell it to the people who live in this land. Those people have already heard that you, Lord, are with us, that you are plainly seen with your cloud, when your cloud stops over us, and that you go before us in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you kill all your people, the nations who have heard of your fame will say, that you killed your people in the wilderness because you were not able to bring them into the land you promised to give them. So is this spin? Okay, so what's he really saying? It's for your reputation, God. God, is that really what you want people to think? Yeah. Verse 17, so now, Lord, I pray, show us your power and do what you promised when you said, I, the Lord, am not angered. Not easily. Not easily angered. And I show great love and faithfulness and forgive sin and rebellion. Yet I will not fail to punish children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generation for the sins of their parents. And where does that come from? From the uh, third commandment. Second commandment. Second commandment, yeah. Second. Okay. And now, Lord, according to the greatness of your unchanging love, forgive, I pray, the sin of these people, just as you have forgiven them ever since they left Egypt. The Lord answered, I will forgive them as you have asked. And is this another case of God interacting from, with Moses to let the people in heaven understand a little more detail about what kind of person Moses was? And showing that Moses understood what kind of God God was. Yeah. This is a very important point in the history of God's relationship with human beings. God was planning to take the children of Israel into the land of Canaan 
at the crossroads between three continents. Remember, that's the corner of, Egypt, uh, of uh, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Um, so that they could be witnesses to all who would pass. Moses was such a friend of God that he essentially asked him, what would the Egyptians think if you allow your people to be destroyed out here and make a great nation of me? Think how many people would jump at the opportunity to have an entire nation named after them. <clears throat> but Moses essentially said, no, God, the important thing is your reputation. What will people think about you? Down through history, God's people are supposed to be his representatives. How often have we done that correctly? Do you think about each time you go about activities every day and you interact with people around you, do you think about what you might be saying to, to them about God? Is God's reputation still important in our day? Well, there's three passages which spell that out in some detail. I don't have time to read all of them. The first one is found in Ephesians 1, 7 to 10. The second one, which I am going to read, is found in Ephesians 3, 9 and 10. And the third one is found in Colossians 1, 19 and 20. But I'm just going to read the, the Ephesians 3 one here. And of making all people see how God's secret plan, that's his mystery, is to be put into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the past ages in order that at the present time, by means of the church, who's involved in the church? That's all of us. You out there, us here, all of us are involved in the church. The angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom and all its different forms. God plans for the universe to learn some, something about him from us. Is that possible? What could they possibly learn about God from us? Well, they could probably see what they shouldn't, what we've done wrong and what, okay. what shouldn't be done. Cause okay. and effect, <laughs> consequences. Yeah. Of but, but now that's about us. What about God? What are they learning about God? How he loves us Long anyway. Long-suffering. <laughs> could it really be too that angelic rulers and powers will learn something about God from us? Think about how God relates to them versus how God has to relate to us rebels. Well, anyway, remember those, those texts you re referred to is, wasn't till the cross mm -hmm. that those things really uh, began to gel with the heavenly intelligences and human beings a little bit slower. Sure. Pick up on the update. A few thousand years slower. <laughs> so well, Paul got it. Yeah. So, so uh, it, it, there's been people down through time. Ellen White picked it up, uh, but there's, it's in the minority, that's for sure. Yeah. How God has had to relate to us as sinners is a new revelation to them. He doesn't have to deal with sinners out there in the universe. God's love is displayed in amazing detail. One of the real challenging issues in this whole story is what God did about the destruction of all those people in the land of Canaan and even those who died in Egypt. Jim? Deuteronomy 2, verses 33 and 34. But the Lord our God put him in power, and we killed him. In our power. In our power, and we killed him, his sons and all his men. All the same time, excuse me, at the same time, we captured and destroyed every town and put everyone to death, men, women, and children. We left no survivors. Good news, Bible. Does that sound like good news? Not really. And it says that about Sihon and his kingdom. It says that about Hog and his kingdom. And if you go over to the book of Joshua, as they're entering the land of Canaan, again and again and again, leaving no survivors, leaving no survivors. Was that really God's plan to leave no survivors? Some people try to get around this situation by just suggesting that the stories are not true. I mean, could that be true? I mean, is, is it possible that... Anyway, go ahead, Carrie. But we who believe in the inspiration of all Scripture cannot accept that. 
So what do we know about the, this whole issue? In Genesis 15, 1 through 16, God had promised Abraham that this area would eventually be given to his descendants. Now you remember that story, if you are familiar with, with Genesis, God came down in the evening and it was dark and Moses, I mean, I'm sorry, Abraham was asked to cut animals in half and lay them out and so forth. And all strange kind of behavior, it seems really bizarre to us, but it turns, when, it turns out when we go back and we look at the, the customs that were done in those days, that's how they, they made contracts. That was the way they did it. And God came down and did it a way that Abraham was familiar with. And he made a, a covenant with Abraham. And what did he tell Abraham about the stars? The Your numbers heart. of his children would be. Yeah. As great as that. Okay, go ahead, Carrie. There is no question about the fact that the people who were destroyed were very sinful and brutal. They offered their children as sacrifices to their pagan gods. Think of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Many of these nations were just as evil. And we need to be honest and remember that a lot more children died in the flood than were killed by the Israelites. Okay, so now we have a challenge. Was God being fair to the Egyptians and the Canaanites? Was he fair at the flood? Was he fair at the flood? Well, is there some broad principles that we can talk about that would maybe help us to better understand that? Not too sure? Well, first thing, well, first thing I would say, one of the first things we need to think about is God looks at the big picture. We're so worried about our little time period for our 70 years or 50 years or 30 years or even if it's 900 years like Adam, it's a minuscule amount of time compared to all of eternity. A minuscule amount of time compared to eternity. So God says, okay, maybe your life is a little bit shorter here right now, but if that leads to the possibility that you could be saved and spend the rest of eternity with me, which do you think is God is more important? It, it, what, which seems more important to God? The few live, years we live here on this earth or the rest of eternity that he wants us to spend with him? Well, if you think about it in those terms, that's a whole different ballpark, isn't it? Yeah. Well, so what should we do with this part of the story? For those who would like a much more detailed explanation of all of this, see this handout and so if you look up our if you go there to www.theox.org and look in the teacher's guide section on exodus was god fair to the egyptians and the canaanites it'll it'll be right there and if you have a handout if you download it to your computer you can just copy this this uh, the thing that's right here and just paste it into your thing and it will it'll pop up there for you and, that's, I think it's 16 pages. Gives you a lot of details about what's going on here. But now let's, let's see if we can come to some basic collection of suggestions. As Bible-believing Christians, we are certain that Jesus Christ was the one who led the children of Israel through all those experiences. 1 Corinthians 10, let me just read that. We have a little bit of extra time. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4. This is Paul, of course, writing, I want you to remember, my brothers and sisters, what happened to our ancestors who followed Moses. They were all under the protection of the cloud, all passed safely through the Red Sea. In the cloud and in the sea, they were all baptized as followers of Moses, all ate the same spiritual bread and drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was Christ himself. The Messiah, okay? Remember that um, Christ is the Greek word for, the Hebrew word Messiah. And you could, it's the same thing, basically. Oh, I just see, let me read these other two verses. Luke 22, 44. Then Jesus, that's Jesus said to them, he, now he's, this is the night after his resurrection. It's that first Sunday night. Jesus said to them, these are the very things I told you about while I was still with you. Everything written about me 
in the law of Moses, what, what, where is the law of Moses found? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Yeah, the five books of Moses. The writings of the prophets, those are the prophetic books, and the Psalms had to come true. So he's saying everything in the Old Testament is about whom? About Jesus. About, about Jesus. The story of the road to Emmaus here, isn't that what that was? Well, it's at the end of that story, Road to Emmaus, they're, they're back in the upper room. The two men from Emmaus are just getting ready to tell their story, and Jesus shows up. Mm -hmm. And that's when he said that. Even earlier in John 5, 39, he said to, to the Sanhedrin, you study the scriptures because you think that in them you will find eternal life, and these very scriptures speak about me. And how, what scriptures were there in the days of Jesus? What we call the Old Testament. Only what we call the Old Testament. There was no New Testament at all. One biblical scholar has chosen to explain this problem in the following words. As creator of all things and all human beings and as sovereign over all, God can do anything he wants with anyone and be right in doing so. Now that's a kind of a cop-out in my, my opinion. Uh, we're, we're trying to ask the question, okay, what does it say to us about God? And to just turn around and just say, well, God can do whatever he wants and that's fine. Well, that might be true. He's the sovereign of the universe. He has the ability to do this. But we're trying to learn about his character and his judgment and so forth. We need to know, we at least to have some idea why he does what he does. Okay. Go ahead. All, all of these words are written by Daniel Block, and they're quoted yeah. in the Bible Study Guide. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is a, a, a commentary. A commentary re, in more recent times. Okay, go ahead. The ways of God are a mystery. Since we will never completely understand Him, we might as well relax with the questions in our minds. Isaiah fifty-five. 8 and 9 offer some consolation. Let's read that really quickly. My thoughts, says the Lord, are not your thoughts, are not like yours, and my ways are different from yours. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my ways and thoughts above yours. Does that mean we shouldn't bother to try to learn about him? He's Very so true. far above us that we... But he wants to, to learn. He wants to bring us all together. Yeah. And you have to spend some time educating. It's not mm -hmm. something, oh, well, uh, you can't understand me, so I'll, I'll just go, uh, oh, that's, that's yeah. you can have a, take that to a re I, I, ridiculous conclusion. I, I want to... All, all of the Gospels, and actually all of the Bible, are saying how God is trying to communicate with us, yeah. tell us what he's like. He says, every, you remember John 15, 15, everything yeah. I've learned I, uh, from my Father I've made known to you. There I'm teaching is. you, I'm educating you. John 15, 15, my yeah. good news Bible. I do not call, this is Jesus on the last night he was with his disciples. I do not call you servants or slaves any longer because servants do not know what their master is doing. So are we supposed to just say, okay, God, whatever. I don't have to know what you're doing. No, Jesus said, instead I call you friends because I have told you everything I've heard from my Father. So what does Jesus say? Well, there's no hierarchy in, in that metaphor. No. no and it was, it's not a useless, useless metaphor. It must be something you're supposed to learn from it. Yeah. Okay, Myra? Okay. According to the biblical picture of the Canaanites, these people were extremely wicked, and their annihilation represents God's judgment for their sin. The destruction of the Canaanites was neither the first nor the last time God would do this. The differences between the Canaanites' fate and the fate of humanity, except for Noah's family, is described, described in Genesis 6 through 9, involves scale and agency. Okay, what do we mean by scale and agency? And Noah's day, how many were killed? Yeah. Everyone except Noah's family. Everyone except seven. And who sent the flood? God did, of course. Well, that's what it says. Okay. God never intended for the Israelites to make the policy of... Harem. Harem. The total destruction. That's in brackets. That's the Hebrew word for total destruction. Okay. As the general policy towards outsiders, Deuteronomy 7 verse 1, expressly identifies and thereby delimits 
the target peoples. The Israelites were not to follow these policies against uh, our Armenians. Arameans. Ar Arameans. Ar Arameans. Arameans. Or Edomites or Egyptians or anyone else. Deuteronomy 20, 10 verse, verses 10 to 18. The Canaanites suffered the fate that ultimately all sinners will face, the judgment of God. This gets better and better. Mm -hmm. God's elimination of the Canaanites was a necessary step in the history of salvation. That's not true. That's not no. from the Bible. This is uh, this no. guy's musings. Okay. Go ahead. We're going to talk about the alternatives here in a moment. Although the Canaanites as a whole were targets of God's judgment, they had at least 40 years of advance warnings. See Rahab's confession in Joshua 2, 8 to 11. Okay, so I think there's a better answer. Yes. Let's go and see if we can talk about it. Oh. <laughs> it is important for us to remember that every person who has ever lived, including all those who died in Egypt and in Canaan, will one day have their cases brought up before the tribunal court in heaven. God will treat them fairly, just as he will treat us fairly in the judgment. If they are savable, if they're safe to live next door to, to for, the next, for the rest of eternity, they will be admitted to heaven. But if they are not, they will perish forever. We believe that we will be given a thousand years, called the millennium, to reveal all of these questions. And we can be sure that when it is all over, we will agree that God has done everything he could have done to save as many people as possible. If it's possible for some of those people to be saved, they will be saved. It's important for us to recognize that there are certain important themes running through the book of Deuteronomy. One, God asks us to remember the events of our past that he believes will give us hope. Two, he fights for us. Three, he fulfills his words. And four, he does it all with grace and justice. The book of Deuteronomy is historically organized around three major events. God's covenant with the people of Mount, at Mount Sinai, that's Deuteronomy 1, 6 to 18. Two, the people's rebellion at Kadesh Barnea, Deuteronomy 1, 19 through 46. And three, the conquest of Gilead against the kings Sihon and Og, Deuteronomy 2, 1, to 329. Having reviewed these events, it is important for us to go back and look at Exodus 23, verses 20 through 33, God's original plan for the conquest of the land of Canaan, what's much simpler and better. And what was that plan? Can it possibly be more simple and better than war? <laughs> well, of course, we'd rather fight, right? So Exodus 23 from Good News Bible, starting with verse 20. Now this is first. We're going way back. This is, this is 40 years. This is back right after God gave them the instructions from Sinai. So this is God's original plan. His original plan actually was in the Garden of Eden. Yes, uh, this yes is his, of course. Quote, original plan for the children of Israel. Yeah. I will send an angel ahead of you to protect you as you travel and to bring you to the place which I have prepared. Pay attention to him and obey him. Do not rebel against him, for I have sent him, and he will not pardon such rebellion. But if you obey him and do everything I command, I will fight against all your enemies. Oh, wait, 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 hold, on, hold on. Who's going to do the fighting? God said oh, he would do it. And how would he do it? Yeah, well, Educate. there's... Read on. Go ahead. Uh, my angel will go ahead of you and take you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will destroy them. Okay, now let's talk about that. Um, destroy the nations that were there could happen in two ways. He could, and, and, and I, the context, we'll find out more details about this later. It doesn't necessarily mean that God plans to literally kill them. It means God will destroy them as nations. He will scatter them. And help them get away from their religious practices. Yeah, You're okay. Going on, so what's the reason for this? Go ahead. Verse 24. Do not bow down to their gods or worship them. 
and do not accept, do not adopt their religious practices, destroy their gods, and break down their sacred stone pillars. So that's that's what that, they needed to do. Exactly. If you worship me, the Lord your God, I will bless you with food and water and take away all your illnesses. In your land, no woman will have a miscarriage, which we talked about before, yeah, exactly. or be without children. No infertility. Right. I will give you long lives. Okay, so what's God saying? I have a plan for you, a very simple, straightforward plan. Just follow me, let me lie, lead the way, follow along, do what I tell you, there will be no problem. Your women won't have any problems. None of you will have any problems. Okay, keep reading. Verse 27, I will make the people who oppose you afraid of me. I will bring confusion among the people against whom you fight. And I will make all your enemies turn and run from you. Okay, now, this needs to be the explanation of up here it said what? I will fight. I will destroy them. How's he going to destroy them? They will no longer be organized nations to fight against the children of Israel. What are they going to do? They're going to turn and run. Verse 28, I will throw your enemies into a panic. I will drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites as you advance. I will not drive them out within one year. If I did, the land would become deserted, and the wild animals would be too many for you. Instead, I will drive them out little by little until there are enough of you to take possession of the land. Okay, so where have the enemies gone now? It might have been incorporated into, into Israel. They, at, at least they've been driven back. They've been driven back. God has Actually, driven them back. And presumably, God's original plan was, okay, these people who are going to be camped on your borders, now you go out and evangelize them. Teach them about me. Okay. And, and Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9 supports that. Mm -hmm. Verse 31, I will make the borders of your land extend from the Gulf of Aqaba to the Mediterranean Sea and from the desert to the Euphrates River. Isn't that about how far David's kingdom eventually was? That's how far David's kingdom was. I will give you power over the inhabitants of the land and you will drive them out as you advance. Do not make any agreements with them or their gods. Do not let these people live in your country. If you do, they will make you sin against me. If you worship their gods, it will be a fatal trap for you. Hmm, I wonder why he said that. It's a recurring theme, a fatal trap. <laughs> wow. So, I mean, here's a straightforward plan spelled out in sufficient detail, simple, perfect, guaranteed to work. What was the problem? They didn't listen. So why didn't the Israelites accept this plan that obviously had the endorsement of God himself? They wanted to do it themselves. Do it their way. Like a small child who does not want any help. No, me, I want to do it my way. They I've wanted never heard that. What? I've never heard that from grandchildren. No, our grandchildren would never children. say anything like that. They just do it, they don't say, tell you. Yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes they tell you if you try to, if you try to argue with them. They wanted the nations around to look upon them as the conquerors instead of crediting God with the victories. How sad. God did not plan for the children of Israel to fight their way into the land. How do we know that for sure? Deuteronomy 1 verse 30, the very history we're talking about. The Lord your God will lead you, and he will fight for, fight for you just as you saw him do in Egypt. How much fighting did they have to do in Egypt? Just left out. Zero. Yeah. Zilch. Nada. Exodus 14, verse 14. Moses told the people, the Lord will fight for you. There's no need for you to do anything. How much fighting were they supposed to do? None. Why don't we... Why don't we... I mean, I don't understand why we, we, we don't seem to get this picture. It's important to note that God did not tell the children of Israel to indiscriminately destroy those people who were in their way. 
He told them to leave alone the peoples of Edom, Moab, and Aramant, the descendants of Ammon, the descendants of Esau and Lot. Israel was not to disturb them. Would you agree with the following summary of what happened in those 40 years and the, fo and the following conquest of Canaan? The biblical text does, does give us some clues about principles that were involved. Jim? God gives. God is the owner and giver of the land. This principle is affirmed several times, that is in Deuteronomy 1, 18, 20, 25, and 35. So, not all of the land has been given to the Israelites. God has given some parts of the land to Edom, as the descendants of Esau, Deuteronomy 2, verse 5, and to Moab and Ammon, as the descendants of Lot. God takes. God does not give the land to the rebellious generation of Israelites who wandered through the wilderness for 40 years. Note that even Moses was not able to enjoy the land because he failed to trust the Lord in Deuteronomy 3.27. God took away the land from the Amorites because they had reached the fullness of their iniquity, Genesis 15.16. The prevention of the Israelites from eternity entering the land and from their death in the wilderness is to be understood as the result of God's judgment, as is the destruction or expulsion of the Canaanites from the land. God fights. This principle, which is repeated again in Joshua, excuse, in Joshua, excuse me, to Joshua, I'm sorry, um, Deuteronomy 3, verse 22, suggests that God was, in fact, the intended author of this operation of judgment. Note that the judgment which implies the eradication of evil also is an act of grace in behalf of God's people. By, from the Bible study guide, pages 28 and 29. Okay, so I hope that all this together, look at it, please. Look at it for yourself. Go back and read Exodus 23. Read Deuteronomy 20. Compare the two. Think about why God changed his plan. Did he change because he decided, oh no, that plan I had before wasn't a good idea. I have a better plan now. No, he changed because that's what the children of Israel wanted. They wanted to do it with their swords. They wanted to be the conquerors. Are we willing to trust God to lead us forward through some very difficult times in the future? Do we need some guidance or do we want to do it with our swords? Now, we're not doing it with swords, but... We want to do it our way. Yeah, well, have we heard that before? How's that working out? Yeah, how well is that working out? Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we read these records from so long ago, written by your friend Moses, who's now in heaven looking down, wondering if we understand what it was that he wrote to us. We wish we had his original words and we could be there and understand it as his first person, but we still have a very good record and we understand, we can understand it. Help us not to make the mistake of thinking that uh, you're marching around with a sword trying to kill anybody who gets out of line. What a sad thing that would be. And also help us to recognize that like the children of Israel of ancient times, you're goal for us is to witness correctly about your character to all around us, those we work with, those we happen to visit each day, the neighbors living next door to us, all those, in fact, that we come in contact with. May that be true. May we correctly represent your character always is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.